Cool. All right, I think it's about time. Uh, so uh, late Friday, last day of the conference. Uh, so thanks for being here uh, instead of napping or going to the airport or getting out of here. So uh, uh, we'll, we're going to go through some things. And what we want to talk about today is using um, Cinder as a storage block storage provider for Kubernetes. Uh, so we'll go through and do some introductions here and get rolling. Um, first off, my name is John Griffith. Uh, I've been working on OpenStack, uh, the Cinder project. Uh, I helped start that uh, about six years ago when it first came to be a thing. Um, so I've been working on that. I've been doing some things in the container space as well, and all kinds of anything cloudy, basically. Uh, these days, I, I kind of work on a little bit and have various things. All of my contact info is, is up here. If you ever want to uh, reach out, ask me any questions, anything follow up on today, Give me a holler. I love to talk. So, and sometimes that's the only thing I'm really good at. So, uh, my name is Huang Minqian. I work for Red Hat, and uh, just at the time Kubernetes took off, I wrote some bunch of plugins. So, uh, if you're using one of those, um, I the five channel, RBD stuff, whatever, and also I do. Um, I'm the one to blame, and uh, also my GitHub IDs and my Twitter. Feel free to follow me. All right. So. Uh, what, what we kind of want to do today is, uh, Juan and I have worked on a number of things with, with Cinder together uh, over the past uh, four, yeah, it's been a while. Uh, so we're going to kind of walk through, and for those of you who may not be familiar with Cinder, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and go through some of that. And then Juan's going to talk about uh, what the volume and the persistence model in Kubernetes looks like today. And then we're going to kind of tag team what we've put together to use Cinder to solve some of those problems. Um, and then talk about where we're going to go, uh, what the future looks like, and then hopefully get some dialogue going with you folks, um, maybe get some input, kind of go from there. So uh, first off, in terms of Cinder and what it is, so the idea of Cinder way back when was to create a block storage as a service, right? So, the whole idea was to give an abstraction, to give something that could be used by a cloud, particularly OpenStack, that would let you plug in various backends and seamlessly consume them as a user. Um, the whole idea is you can scale this out, you can scale this in, uh, you can dynamically change things uh, behind the scenes without your users ever knowing. Right? So that was the whole idea. One of the other things that some people aren't really aware of is we did have all along this idea of having it be a standalone service. Um, so if you're familiar with OpenStack, you may know of a project called Swift. Um, they had sort of the same model. It's an object store. It can be used in OpenStack or outside of OpenStack. All right? And so that's kind of the same thing we want to do with Cinder. We want to make it something that is useful uh, for OpenStack, and that may be its primary use case. Um, but it's extremely valuable, uh, as you can see these days, because there's at least eight or nine that I count right now uh, projects out there that are trying to abstract storage devices into an interface, right? So we've already got one. Uh, it's been out there for, for almost seven years. It's got over 70 or 80 backends that are supported. And it's been used in production by really, really large clouds for a long time. So it's battle tested. It's got a ton of features. Um, we've had thousands and thousands of bug, bug fixes over the years. Uh, so it's solid. It's rock solid. So it's a really good choice. And best of all, we've got a great community with, with over 500 contributors. And that's, that's just code contributors. So it's a, it's a pretty huge deal. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it, it's not something that, that is just for OpenStack. Uh, so I, I've been doing this uh, crazy demo thing on, for a couple of years now on using Cinder uh, as a standalone thing in... Uh, Docker, as well as Kubernetes and Swarm and everything else. And for anybody that's seen my demos, you probably know why I'm not going to do a live demo today. So uh, I, I used to have good odds, and right now these days I'm at like a I got like a two in ten shot. So I'm not I'm just don't do them anymore. Um, but that's okay. Uh, I put the stuff on my blog, and you can check it out there. Uh, but the cool thing is one of the things that we uh, did recently is we went ahead and we put. Uh, stuff in the Cinder repository in the, in the master tree to actually containerize Cinder and run it as a service using a Docker Compose file. So 
for all those people out there that you hear, you know, OpenStack projects are hard to deploy and they're difficult to upgrade and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the whole idea behind this was just to say, hey, you know, that, a lot of that is not true. Um, so inside of the contrib directory, inside of the Cinder repo, there's a compose file. Um, you can go in and you can do a make to build the images, the Docker images, and then you can do a compose up and actually have a full-blown running Cinder service on your system. Now, I say, you know, oh, that's it, you're done, right? Okay, it's not really that simple if you want to do something in production, but if you want to just try it out, it, it's extremely simple. Um, so you can take that, uh, you can modify it and everything. So check it out, it's on GitHub. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool, so of course it's cool, right? Um, so these are the steps. Uh, you clone the repo, you CD into the contrib directory, you run a make. What the make does is it uses a project called Loki that builds all of the images that you need. So you're gonna get uh, a Cinder API container, a Cinder volume container, a uh, controller container, a database container, and a RabbitMQ container. It's gonna build those up, and you're gonna modify your compose file if you want to, run compose up, and that's it. You're ready to go. So if you wanna modify it and use a backend that you have, maybe you have a, a Ceph backend or a, a NetApp backend or a Hitachi backend, some other backend that's supported in Cinder that you wanna plug into it, you can just modify the comp file just like you normally do, and you now have support with, with the standalone thing. Um, now, you can use this for things like uh, local storage usage and storage consumption, or you can get into really cool things and plug it into Kubernetes. So I'll let Waman talk a little bit about that. So Kubernetes, um, that's, and bare metal, that is something we want to make similar to happen and uh, to manage the storage that you previously have uh, orchestrated by Cinder. Um, if you look at the Kubernetes volumes, um, there are two types. Uh, the ones that works for hypervisors and the ones that works on um, bare metal. The ones that work for hypervisors, what you have is volume ID. Like you get a AWS, EBS, you get a volume ID, and on Cinder, you get another volume ID. It's an abstraction of the reference um, in a database that's only the cloud and the cl hypervisor knows. But on the other hand, when you're working with bare metal, you get all kinds of PV types that gives you detailed information how, do you, how to connect the host to the backend storage. Just take an uh, instance of the NFS. You have the server's IP address, you have the exports, and from that point, you can make a month. If you go through the ISCAS and the clusters, things like that, so you know the endpoints and you know the paths where the volumes can be attached. And that is something we really want to have from Cinder and how this magic works it's from the abstraction, the volume ID to the endpoints that's associated with each of the basic PVs. And that's the thing we want to ha make that happen in this project. And why do we want to make that happen? We want to take advantage of all the features that Cinder already provided to us and that are not pre presented to Kubernetes yet. Uh, if you have wonderful volumes, backends, and that have uh, all the features already works pretty well on Cinder, but you don't have these features working on Kubernetes yet, then you can just leverage Cinder to make all this happen to your wonderful storage. And so far, we have a uh, lot of things in Kubernetes, the dynamic, dynamic provisioning, the attach and detach, meaning that you can do a third patch attach and detach, and we also recently added the volume expand, um, so-called resize feature, and that just happens in the 1.9. And a snapshot, that uh, works off, out of tree, but it's almost functionally ready. It works on limited uh, storage backends. Then there happens to be one of those, and thanks for the wonderful contributors. Before we go into the details, let's look at how the volumes, um, Cinder volume works for in Kubernetes. So you have the Kubernetes master, uh, master controller master, a bunch of controllers running over there. And um, things are interesting to us is the provisioners and uh, attach and detach controllers. So if you create some volumes, you call the Cinder SDK uh, provision, uh, creates essentially equivalent to what Cinder creates commands gives to you. And you get the volume, it's a volume ID. And from that point, you call the SDK to attach this volume to a certain um, Nova instance. And under the hood, uh, Nova, as well as the OS brick, 
um, details, we will get some detailed information about the connection, and then a touch happens. All right. Just like that. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I just shaved my beard this morning. <laughs> So this is the model we are used to, and if you run uh, op uh, um, Kubernetes and OpenShift on OpenStack, this is how it works. Now, we're going to change the, the flow a little bit, uh, just to make sure the biomentals, uh, the, machi the host machines can get the detailed connection info, so the host can make uh, direct connections without OS Brick and without Nova. So how it works, and um, the picture looks pretty much the same. We don't add a lot of stuff, except there's uh, some uh, magic over happens over there. Before we go to the details, and um, here is the workflow. So we still have the stock biomental Kubernetes uh, cluster, and nothing changed. And we still use the uh, Cinder volume, and everything, uh, the stock Cinder, and it could be a containerized, or it could be a standing OpenStack setup. And we still use the existing the storage types, uh, iSCSI fiber channel and RBD. The, nothing changes over there. Um, at the high level, uh, we own, the only thing we add to the picture is pretty much standard. We have an external or single volume provisioner. Uh, that's, that's our whole trick for us. And uh, the workflow is um, we request for uh, PVC. Obviously, you have to define storage class. And once the storage class is defined and your PVC use, use that storage class, then it's going to our provisioner, and the provisioner talk to Cinder and use the Cinder uh, API and create the volume, just still use the Cinder API, and then get the connection info, and still that is also a Cinder API. So nothing intrusive, pretty much standard. And uh, from that point, we, get a not, we do not return the Cinder volume ID but we return the um, underlying connection info. Is up. If that is iSCSI, we will convert the Cinder volume to iSCSI volume. If that's RPD, we get RPD volume. So everything is, happens over there. From the user standpoints and from the Kubernetes perspective, pretty much nothing changed. And you don't need a hypervisor anymore, and you don't need OS brick anymore. So it's not intrusive. Cool. So. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of walk through the, the process a little bit and, and kind of click these slides. Um, so I said we raise questions and stuff at the end. Also, if as we're going through these, if you have questions, we've got plenty of time, so raise your hand, shout out, and we'll, we'll kind of dig into it, right? So it, it's actually really simple. Um, so we've got this external provisioner. It's sitting out there, and it's listening, and it's monitoring, and it's basically looking to see for, for PVC requests on the Kubernetes side, right? Most of the external plugins these days, this is a... This is how they all work. This isn't anything revolutionary or new or anything yeah, like that. Well, it was, yeah, when we first did it. <laughs> so let me take that back. Now everybody copied us. <laughs> all right, so uh, the first thing that comes in, the provisioner, it sees a request for a PVC, capacity 100 gig, uh, access mode read-write, storage class is sender, um, and a volume type, so one of the things you can do is so Cinder has the ability to specify volume types, and that can give you things like replication, quality of service, compression features, deduplication features, all that stuff, any custom feature, that's where that goes, right? So you can put that in your YAML, in your pod file, and, and expose that this way, and that'll go through. Does the volume type also express the back end preference? Yep. The next thing that'll happen is the provisioner will go and just call out to Cinder, just like anything else. It'll use the Cinder API. It'll do a Cinder create request, give it all the parameters that you fed in, everything that's needed. Do that. And it'll come back and it'll just give the Cinder volume ID. So now the provisioner will have a Cinder volume ID, so it's got a handle, knows what to do, and it associates it with the, the volume handle that you put in your pod file. So that's the, that's the dynamic provisioning piece, which is fairly simple. Uh, the next part is the attachment. Uh, attachment's pretty simple. You want to? Okay. All right. So uh, we, we do kind of the same thing. Uh, the provisioner uh, 
gets the request to do an attach. So what happens is it goes ahead and it calls out to sender and it does what sender expects, which is called a reserve, which just says, hey, mark this volume as something that's, that's flagged is going to be used and attached. It'll then go and it'll call an initialized connection. And this is actually the important call. So this call is what includes all of the things like for iSCSI, for example. It includes the initiator IQN, the host IP address, all that sort of thing, right? So that's where all the data actually is. And then it responds. You can see over here on the left, um, it goes ahead and, and responds back to the provisioner and back to Kubernetes with all of that. And then we call the Kubernetes iSCSI mounter or RBD mounter. All right, so then we call that and we go ahead and we attach that volume to the bare metal node, right? So now you have a cinder volume attached to bare metal. Connection's all done. We notify cinder that we're finished, which then in turn calls an attachment completion, which on the cinder side marks the volume as in use. Now the thing that's cool about this is as Kubernetes progresses, as the Kubernetes APIs for storage progress and things like that, there's a lot of things that you know, people want to do, right? And they, and they can't do yet because it's not in the API. But the thing that's cool is now you have this other piece. You have this cinder piece. So you can go in from here and you can do things like uh, cloning and replication and all of those things that may or may not be in the Kubernetes API anytime soon. Right? Yeah, Lewis. We are going to address that in the following slides. Yep. <laughs> Good call, though. <laughs> yep. So, all right. Anything else on this one before we? Okay. You want to talk about this one? Or? Yeah, sure. Okay. And uh, before we go there, I will have to make a big thank for Adam and Adam make all this happen. Otherwise, we are just standing here and just talking for on paper. And. Uh, the code is actually in the Kubernetes external storage and in the new incubator has been heavily contributed by community helpers. Uh, it works pretty well on a number of plugins on iSCSI and uh, RBD. These are the first because iSCSI obviously gets the, the best adoption so far. Um, back to Louis' question. Um, the QEMU and the QCAL, um, that's going to potentially could be the bridger for things like a cluster and an IFS that does not have the native block device support. Because Cinder essentially provisions the block device and the block device on the NFS or cluster is just a file emulation. So the TCMUI runner could be the bridging technology for that to happen. And also QMU. Um, so that's the... All right. As John mentioned, we leverage Cinder a lot, not just by the drivers or repositories, also by Cinder's uh, rich set of features. And for things that haven't happened to Kubernetes yet, or haven't happened to the drivers yet, and if it works for Cinder, it's going to work the, out of the box for your backend. If you have your wonderful iSCSI backend that is already working in Cinder, but you don't really have the snapshot controller working on the backend, just use Cinder for that. If you have, because right now, the, just take for another example, the volume resize in Kubernetes does not work on individual drivers yet, but it works for Cinder. If you need this feature and you don't have that one on iSCSI plugins, use Cinder. And replication, that hasn't happened to Kubernetes yet, use Cinder already have it. So that's another place. Right. CSI, um, I know that it's a hot topic, and uh, where we can go from here. And just before this uh, presentation, we just merged the Cinder CSI driver for the convenience. Uh, it doesn't have all these cool features yet, but it's going to be a good starting point. And uh, from that point, from there on, we have, have um, enablement for lots of drivers without having to have individual drivers sitting underneath. And so for those who are, I know there's already uh, so many CSI presentations, just for those who haven't gone to those presentations, uh, CSI so far in living in the repositories, they are provisioners. 
and um, that's why just creates and deletes volumes. Attached attachers, that's just manage the attachments and the drivers, that's manage the node mounts and unmounts. So, as you see, Cinder already, the Cinder CSI driver already handles all these three. All we need to do is to expose the connecting info and then hopefully everything will work from there. So, uh, you know, a couple of things to, to point out. Um, one of the reasons why this is, is kind of valuable right now is sort of part of a, a transition process, right? So one of the things that I didn't really touch on about Cinder and the way it works as far as the drivers, um, on the Cinder side, to submit a driver into that code base, you have to actually fulfill a set of behaviors. And, and so we actually run a continuous integration test on every patch that gets submitted, and it has to run against every one of the drivers in the tree. So that gives you a little bit more in terms of being able to support it, make sure everything works, and stuff like that. And then best of all, what it means is you can swap devices in and out from, from behind this without your users ever knowing, without your applications ever knowing, and not impacting any of your workflow. Right? So that's where the advantage is. Granted, it's not for everybody. Um, you know, there's some people that, that definitely are going to want to go and, and write their own uh, CSI driver or whatever plugin and stuff like that, and that's great. Um, this is just another option for a lot of people that um, I think has a lot of benefit. Uh, especially when it comes to the support and testing model, right? Because this has been tested pretty thoroughly. So, um, but I think, I think with that, uh, oh, you had some. Oh, okay. That's, oh, I kind of just touched that. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I think that's about pretty much what we got. Hopefully, uh, you guys got some questions. Maybe you're interested or feedback. Crickets. All right. Well, um, you can reach out to either one of us, IRC, Slack, email, Carrier Pigeon, GitHub. Not if they're iSCSI or RBD. So as long as, as long as there are those two protocols, they work. Um, the other protocols like NFS and things like that, uh, the, you know, that's, that's new technology yep. will be required. Right. Uh, as as an channel, potentially. We haven't done anything with fiber channel yet. But you can write a patch. You know how to do it. You know how to do it. You're already familiar with this. I know you. <laughs> So the question was, have we done anything with AZ awareness in Cinder? So if, if you're familiar with Cinder, it has availability zone type model. We haven't really put any of that into this provisioner yet. Because quite frankly, right now, I, I don't know. Kubernetes yeah, Kubernetes doesn't have any way to, to interpret that, right? Now, there might be something interesting you could do in your pod file to try and distribute your, your storage a little bit. That, there might be something you could do, but that's only half of it, right? So, um, but again, pull requests. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be awesome. Yes, sir. That was actually, I forgot to talk about that. So uh, I started working last night a little bit, but it was a really late night, so I didn't get very far. Um, on converting this to uh, run in pods and possibly be dumped into a Helm chart. Um, it's not there right now, uh, but it certainly can be. So you and I are gonna talk here in a few minutes and we're gonna look at doing that. Um, because that would be pretty cool, right? Because you could say, hey, run this script to, to launch a Cinder service inside of my Kubernetes deployment and then use that and consume it from my Kubernetes deployment. So that'd be pretty cool. Just uh, some piggyback for this question. So there's actually a chart for the incubator, external storage, and there's a PR going on from Mr. Sergey. Oh, yeah. excellent. Not, probably not for that one. But something along those yeah. lines. Cool. Along those lines. Yeah. Anyone else? Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Again, especially on a Friday last day. So.